Chapter 26 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. The Rival Sisters. Continued. Louis XV's involuntary exclamation when he first set eyes on the loveliness of Madame de la Tournelle, Heavens, how beautiful she is, becomes intelligible when we look on Natier's picture of this fairest of the Dinel sisters in his allegory of the daybreak and read the contemporary descriptions of her charms. She ravished the eye, we are told, with her skin of dazzling whiteness her elegant carriage, her free gestures, the enchanting glance of her big blue eyes, a gaze of which the cunning was veiled by sentiment, by the smile of a child, moist lips, a bosom surging, heaving, ever agitated by the flux and reflux of life, by a physiognomy at once passionate and mutinous. And to these seductions were added a sunny temperament, an infectious gaiety of spirit and a playful wit which made her infinitely attractive to men much less susceptible than the amorous louis it is little wonder then that in the reaction which followed his stormy grief for his dead love the comtesse de vintimille he should turn from the lacrimose companionship of madame de mailly to bask in the sunshine of this third of the beautiful sisters madame de la tournelle and that the wish to possess her should fire his blood. But Madame de la Tournelle was not to prove such an easy conquest as her two sisters, who had come almost unasked to his arms. At the time when she came thus dramatically into his life, she was living with Madame de Mazarin, a strong-minded woman who had no cause to love Louis, who had thwarted and opposed him more than once, and who was determined at any cost to keep her protégé and pet out of his clutches and his desires had also two other stout opponents in cardinal fleury his old mentor and maurepas the most subtle and clever of his ministers each of whom for different reasons was strongly adverse to this new and dangerous liaison which would make him the tool of richelieu's favourite and richelieu's party thus for months Louis found himself baffled in all his efforts to win the prize on which he had set his heart until, in September, 1742, one formidable obstacle was removed from his path by the death of Madame de Mazarin. To Madame de la Tournelle the loss of her protectress was little short of a calamity, for it left her not only homeless, but practically penniless, and, in her extremity, she naturally turned hopeful eyes to the king of whose passion she was well aware at least she hoped he might give her some position at his court which would rescue her from poverty when she begged maurepas madame de mazarin's kinsman and heir to appeal to the king on her behalf his answer was to order her and her sister madame de flavacourt to leave the hotel mazarin thus making her plight still more desperate but fortunately in this hour of her greatest need she found an unexpected friend in louis's ill-used queen who ignorant of her husband's infatuation for the beautiful madame de la tournelle sent for her spoke gracious words of sympathy to her and announced her intention of installing her in madame de mazarin's place as a lady of the palace thus did fortune smile on madame just when her future seemed darkest but her troubles were by no means at an end fleury and maurepas were more determined than ever that the king should not come into the power of a woman so alluring and so dangerous and they exhausted every expedient to put obstacles in her path and to discover and support rival claimants to the post for once however louis was adamant he had not waited so long and feverishly for his prize to be balked when it seemed almost in his grasp. Madame de la Tournelle should have her place at his court, and it would not be his fault if she did not soon fill one more exalted and intimate. Thus it was then that Fleury submitted to him the list of applicants, with la Tournelle's name at the bottom, 
he promptly rewrote it at the head of the list and handed it back to the cardinal with the words the queen is decided and wishes to give her the place we can picture madame de Mailly's distress and suspense while these negotiations were proceeding she had as we have seen in the previous chapter been supplanted by one sister in the king's affection and just as she was recovering some of her old position in his favour she was threatened with a second dethronement by another sister in her alarm she flew to madame de la tournelle to set her fears at rest one way or the other can it be possible that you are going to take my place she asked the tears streaming down her cheeks quite impossible my sister answered madame with a smile and madame de Mailly, thus reassured returned to versailles the happiest woman in france to learn a few days later that it was not only possible it was an accomplished fact for the second time and now as she knew well finally she was ousted from the affection of the king she loved so sincerely and again it was a sister who had done her this grievous wrong she was determined however that she would not quit the field without a last fight and she knew she had doughty champions in Fleury and Marpa who still refused to acknowledge defeat. Although Madame de la Tournelle was now installed in the palace, the day of Louis's conquest had not arrived. The gratification of his passion was still thwarted in several directions. Not only was Madame de Mailly's presence a difficulty and a reproach to him, his new favourite was by no means willing to respond to his advances. Her heart was still engaged to the Du d'Agnois, and was not hers to dispose of. Richelieu, however, was quick to dispose of this difficulty. He sent the handsome Duc de Languedoc, exposed him to the attractions of a pretty woman, and before many weeks had passed, was able to show Madame de la Tournelle passionate letters addressed to her rival by her lover, as evidenced of the worthlessness of his vows, thus arming her pride against him and disposing her at last to lend a more favourable ear to the king as for madame de Mailly, her shrift was short in spite of her tears her pleadings her caresses louis made no concealment of his intention to be rid of her no sorrow no humiliation was lacking in the death struggle of love the king spared her nothing he did not even spare her those harsh words which snapped the bonds of the most vulgar liaisons and the climax came when he told the heartbroken woman as she cringed pitifully at his feet you must go away this very day my sacrifices are finished she sobbed a little later to the judas richelieu when with friendly words he urged her to humour the king and go away at least for a time it will be my death but i will be in paris to-night and while madame de Mailly was carrying her crushed heart through the darkness to her exile the king and richelieu disguised in large perukes and black coats were stealing across the great courtyards to the rooms of madame de la tournelle where the king's long waiting was to have its reward and the following day the usurper was callously writing to a friend doubtless meuse will have informed you of the trouble i had in ousting madame de Mailly. at least i obtained a mandate to the effect that she was not to return until she was sent for no portrait says de goncourt referring to this letter is to be compared with such a confession it is the woman herself with the cynicism of her hardness her shameless and cold-blooded ingratitude it is as though she drives her sister out by the two shoulders with those words which have the coarse energy of the lower orders louis at last happy in the achievement of his desire was not long in discovering that in the third of the nell sisters he had his hands more full than with either of her predecessors madame de Mailly and the comtesse de vintimille had been content to play the role of mistress and to receive the king's none too lavish largesse with gratitude madame de la tournelle was not so complaisant so easily satisfied she intended and she lost no time in making the king aware of her intention to have her position recognized by the world at large to reign as montespan had reigned to have the treasury placed at her disposal and her children if she had any made legitimate her last stipulation was that she should be made a duchess before the end of the year and to all these proposals louis gave a meek 
assent to show further her independence she soon began to drive her lover to distraction by her caprices and her temper she tantalized at once rebuffed and excited the king by the most adroit comedies and those coquetries which are the strength of her sex assuring him that she would be delighted if he would transfer his affection to other ladies and while the favourite was thus revelling in the insolence of her conquest her supplanted sister was eating out her heart in paris her despair was terrible the trouble of her heart refused consolation begged for solitude found vent every moment in cries for louis those who were around her trembled for her reason for her life again and again she made up her mind to start for the court to make a final appeal to the king but each time when the carriage was ready she burst into tears and fell back upon her bed as for louis chilled by the coldness of his mistress distracted by her whims and rages his heart often yearned for the woman he had so cruelly discarded and separation did more than all her tears and caresses could have done to awake again the love he fancied was dead when madame de la tournelle paid her first visit as maitre en titre to choisy nothing would satisfy her but an escort of the noblest ladies in france including a princess of the blood her progress was that of a queen and in return for this honour wrung out of the king's weakness she repaid him with weeks of coldness and ill-humour she refused to play at cavagnon with him she barricaded herself in her room refusing to open to all her lover's knocking and vented her vapours on him with or without provocation until as she considered she had reduced him to a becoming submission then she used her power and her coquetries to wheedle out of him one concession after another including a promise by the king to return unopened any letters madame de Mailly might send to him nor was she content until her sister was finally disposed of by the grant of a small pension and a modest lodging in the luxembourg before the year closed madame de la tournelle was installed in the most luxurious apartments at versailles and louis now completely caught in her toils was the slave of her and his senses flinging himself into all the license of passion and reviving the nightly debauches from which the dead comtesse had weaned him and while her lover was thus steeped in sensuality his mistress was with infinite tact pursuing her ambition affecting an indifference to affairs of the state she was gradually and with seeming reluctance worming herself into the position of chief counsellor and while professing to despise money she was draining the exchequer to feed her extravagance never was king so hopelessly in the toils of a woman as louis the well-beloved in those of madame de la tournelle he accepted as meekly as a child all her coldness and caprices her jealousies and her rages and was ideally happy when in a gracious mood she would allow him to assist at her toilet as the reward for some regal present of diamonds horses or gowns it was after one such privileged hour that louis with childish pleasure handed to his favourite the patent creating her duchess de chateauroux enclosed in a casket of gold and with it a rapturous letter in which he promised her a pension of eighty thousand livres the better to maintain her new dignity having thus achieved her greatest ambition the duchess as we must now call her aspired to play a leading part in the affairs of europe france and prussia were leagued in war against the forces of england austria and holland this was a seductive game in which to take a hand and thus we find her stimulating the sluggard kingliness in her lover urging him to leave his debauches and to lead his armies to victory assuring him of the gratitude and admiration of his subjects nothing less she told him would save his country from disaster to this appeal and temptation louis was not slow to respond and in may seventeen forty four we find him to the delight of his soldiers and all france on the seat of war reviewing his troops speaking words of high courage to them visiting hospitals and canteens and actually sending back a haughty message to the dutch i will give you your answer in flanders no wonder the army was roused by enthusiasm or that it exclaimed with one voice at last we have found a king 
So strong was Louis in his new martial resolve that he actually refused Madame de Chateauroux permission to accompany him. France was delighted that at last her king had emancipated himself from petticoat influence, but the delight was short-lived, for before he had been many days in camp, the Duchess made her stately appearance, and saws and hammers were at work making a covered way between the house assigned to her and that occupied by the king. A fortnight later Ypres had fallen, and she was writing to Richelieu, This is mighty pleasant news and gives me huge pleasure. I am overwhelmed with joy to take Ypres in nine days. You can think of nothing more glorious, more flattering to the king, and his great-grandfather, great as he was, never did the like. But grief was coming quickly on the heels of joy. The king was seized with a sudden and serious illness, after a banquet shared with his ally, the king of Prussia, and in a few days a malignant fever had brought him face to face with death. Madame de Chateauroux watched his sufferings with the eyes of despair. Leaning over the pillow of the dying man, aghast and trembling, she fights for him with sickness and death, terror and remorse. With locked door she keeps her jealous watch by his bedside, allowing none to enter but Richelieu, the doctors and nurses, whilst outside are gathered the princes of the blood and the great officers of the court, clamoring for admittance. It was a grim environment for the deathbed of a king, this struggle for supremacy in which a frail woman defied the powers of France for the monopoly of his last hours, and chief of all the terrors that assailed her was the dread of that climax to it all, when her lover would have to make his last confession, the price of his absolution being, as she well knew, a final severance from herself. Over this protracted and unseemly duel, in which blows were exchanged, entrance was forced, and princes and ministers crowded indecently around the king's bed, over the duchess's tearful pleadings with the confessor to spare her the disgrace of dismissal, we must hasten to the crowning moment when Louis, feeling that he was dying, hastily summoned a confessor who, a few moments later, flung open the door of the closet in which the duchess was waiting and weeping, and pronounced the fatal words, The king commands you to leave his presence immediately. Then followed that secret flight to Paris, amid a torrent of maledictions, the duchess hiding herself from view as best she could, and at each town and village where horses were changed, slinking back and taking refuge in some by-road until she could resume her journey then it was that in her grief and despair she wrote to richelieu oh my god what a thing it all is i give you my word it is all over with me one would need to be a poor fool to start it all over again but louis was by no means a dead man from the day on which he received absolution from his manifold sins he made such haste to recover that, within a month, he was well again and eager to fly to the arms of the woman he had so abruptly abandoned with all other earthly vanities. It was one thing, however, to dismiss the Duchess, and quite another to call her back. For a time she refused point-blank to look again on the king who had spurned her from fear of hell and when at last she consented to receive the penitent at versailles she let him know in no vague terms that it would cost france too many heads if she were to return to his court vengeance on her enemies was the only price she would accept for forgiveness and this price louis promised to pay in liberal measure one after the other those who had brought about her humiliation were sent to disgrace or exile from the duc de chatillon to la rochefoucauld and perseu maurepas the most virulent of them all the king declined to exile but he consented to a compromise he should be made to offer madame an abject apology to grovel at her feet a punishment with which she was content and when the great minister presented himself by her bedside in fear and trembling to express his profound penitence and to beg her to return to court all she answered was, Give me the king's letters and go. The following Saturday she fixed on as the day of her triumphant return, but it was death that was to raise her from the bed on which she had received the king's submission at the hands of his prime minister. Within twenty-four hours she was seized with violent convulsions and delirium. 
In her intervals of consciousness she shrieked aloud that she had been poisoned, and called down curses on her murderer, Morpaw. For eleven days she passed from one delirious attack to another, and as many times she was bled. But all the skill of the court physicians was powerless to save her, and at five o'clock in the morning on the 8th December, the Duchess drew her last tortured breath in the arms of Madame de Mailly, the sister she had so cruelly wronged. Two days later, the Goncourt tells us, she was buried at St. Sulpice, an hour before the customary time for interments, her coffin guarded by soldiers to protect it from the fury of the mob. As for Madame de Mailly, she spent the last years of her troubled life in the odor of a tardy sanctity, washing the feet of the poor, ministering to the sick, bringing consolation to those in prison, and she was laid to rest among the poorest in the Cimetière des Innocentes, wearing the hair shirt which had been part of her penance during life, and with a simple cross of wood for all monument. End of chapter 26「Chapter 27 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Simona Russo. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall Chapter 27 A Mistress of Intrigue On 11th September, Madame de Motteville says, we saw arrive from Italy three nieces of Cardinal Mazarin and a nephew. Two Mancini sisters and the nephew were the children of the youngest sister of his eminence, and of the sisters, Lore, the elder, was a pleasing brunette with a handsome face about twelve or thirteen years of age. The second, Olympe, also brunette, had a long face and pointed chin. Her eyes were small but lively and it might be expected that, when fifteen years of age, she would have some charm. According to the rules of beauty, it was impossible to grant her any, save that of having dimples in her cheeks. Such, at the age of nine or ten, was Olympe Mancini, who, in spite of her childish lack of beauty, was destined to enslave the handsomest king in Europe and after a life of discreditable intrigues in which she incurred the stigma of witchcraft and murder to end her career in obscurity shunned by all who had known her in her day of splendour it was a singular freak of fortune which translated the mancini girls from their modest home in italy to the magnificence of the french court as the adopted children of their uncle cardinal mazarin the virtual ruler of france and the avowed lover if not as some say the husband of anne of austria the queen mother see those little girls said the wife of marechal de villeroy to gaston d'orleans pointing to the mancini children the centre of an admiring crowd of courtiers they are not rich now but some day they will have fine chateaux large incomes splendid jewels beautiful silver and perhaps great dignities and how true this prophecy proved, we know, for the cardinal's five Mancini nieces, for three others came later as their uncle's protégés, Laure found a husband in the Duc de Mercoeur, grandson of Henry the Fourth. Two others lived to wear the coronet of Duchesse. Olympe, as we shall see, became Comtesse de Soissons, and Marie, after narrowly missing the queendom of France, became the wife of the constable Colonna, one of the greatest nobles of Italy. Nor is there anything in such high alliances to cause surprise, for their future was in the hands of the most powerful, ambitious, and wealthy men in France. From their first appearance as his guests, they were received with open arms by Louis's court. They were speedily transferred to the Palais Royal, to be brought up with the boy king, Louis the Fourteenth, and his brother, the Prince of Anjou, while the queen herself not only paid them the most flattering attentions and treated them as her own children but herself undertook part of their education it was under such enviable conditions that the young daughters of a poor roman baron grew up to girlhood the pets of the queen and the court the playfellows of the king 
and the acknowledged heiresses of their uncle's millions and of them all not one had a keener eye to the future than olympe of the long face pointed chin and dimples it was she who entered with the greatest zest into the romps and games of her playmate louis the fourteenth who surrounded him with the most delicate flatteries and attentions and practised all her childish arts and coquetries to win his favours and she succeeded to such an extent that it was always the company of olympe and not of her more beautiful sisters hortense laure or marie that louis most sought not that olympe was always to remain the plain unattractive child madame de motteville described in sixteen forty seven each year as it passed added some touch of beauty developed some latent charm until at eighteen she was very fair to look upon her eyes now said madame de motteville were full of fire her complexion had become beautiful her face less thin her cheeks took dimples which gave her a fresh charm and she had fine arms and beautiful hands she certainly seemed charming in the eyes of the king and sufficiently pretty to indifferent spectators that she had wooers in plenty even before she was so far advanced in the teens was inevitable but her personal preferences counted for little in face of the cardinal's determination to find for her as for all his nieces a splendid alliance which should shed lustre on himself and thus it was that without any consultation of her heart olympe's hand was formally given to prince eugene de savoy comte de soissons a man in whose veins flowed the royal strains of savoy and france it was a brilliant match indeed for the daughter of a petty italian baron and mazarin saw that it was celebrated with becoming magnificence on the twentieth february sixteen fifty seven we see a brilliant company repairing to the queen's apartments the comte de soissons escorting his betrothed dressed in a gown of silver cloth with a bouquet of pearls on her head valued at more than fifty thousand livres and so many jewels that their splendour joined to the natural eclat of her beauty caused her to be admired by every one immediately afterwards the nuptials were celebrated in the queen's chapel then the illustrious pair after dining with the princess de carignan savoy ascended to the apartments of his eminence the cardinal where they were entertained to a magnificent supper at which the king and monsieur did the company the honour of joining them then followed two days of regal receptions a visit to notre dame to hear mass with the queen herself as escort and a stately journey to the hotel de soissons where the contessa's mother-in-law testified to her by her joy and the rich presents which she made her how great was the satisfaction with which she regarded this marriage thus raised to the rank of a princess of the blood olympe was by no means the proud and happy woman she ought to have been she had in fact aspired much higher she had had dreams of sharing the throne of france with her handsome young playmate the king and to louis wife though she now was she had lost none of the attraction she possessed when he called her his little sweetheart in their childish games together he continued to visit her with the greatest regularity to quote mr noel williams indeed scarcely a day went by on which his majesty's coach did not stop at the gate of the hotel de soissons and olympe basking in the rays of the royal favour rapidly took her place as the brilliant intriguing great lady nature intended her to be it is little wonder perhaps that olympe's foolish head was turned by such flattering attentions from her sovereign or that she began to give herself airs and to treat members of the royal family with a haughty patronage even la grande mademoiselle did not escape her insolence for as she herself records when i paid her a thousand compliments and told her that her marriage had given me the greatest joy and that i hoped we should always be good friends she answered me not a word but olympe's supremacy was not to remain much longer unchallenged the king's vargan fancy was already turning to her younger sister marie whose childish plainness had now ripened to a beauty more dazzling than her own the witchery of large and brilliant black eyes a complexion of pure olive luxuriant 
jet black hair a figure of singular suppleness and grace and a sprightliness of wit and a gaieté de coeur which the comtesse could not hope to rival it soon began to be rumoured in court that louis spent hours daily in the company of mazarin's beautiful niece a rumour which hortense mancini supports in her memoir the presence of the king who seldom stirred from our lodging often interrupted us she says my sister marie alone was undisturbed and you can easily understand that his assiduity had charms for her who was the cause of it because it had none for others and as louis's visits to the mancini lodging became more and more frequent each adding a fresh link to the chain that was binding him to her young sister madame de soissons saw less and less of him until an amused tolerance gave place to a genuine alarm it was nothing less than an outrage that she who had so long held first place in the king's favour should be ousted by a mere child the last person in the world whom she could have thought of as a rival but the countess was no woman to be easily dethroned although at every court ball fete or ballet louis was now inseparable from her sister she affected to ignore these open slights and lost no opportunity in public of vaunting her intimacy with his majesty even to the extent on one occasion as mademoiselle records of taking louis's seat at a ball supper and compelling him to share it with her but such shameless arrogance only served to estrange the king still further and to make him seek still more the company of the young sister who had already captured his heart as the comtesse had never captured it when louis made his memorable journey to lyons to meet the princess margaret of savoie it was to marie that he paid the most courtly and tender attentions during the journey says mademoiselle he did not address a word to comtesse de soissons and indeed on more than one occasion he showed a marked aversion to her at saint jean d'angely louis not only himself escorted marie to her lodging he stayed with her until two o'clock in the morning nothing her sister hortense records could equal the passion which the king showed and the tenderness with which he asked of marie her pardon for all she had suffered for his sake it was indeed no secret at court that he had offered her marriage and had taken a solemn vow that neither margaret of savoie nor the infanta of spain should be his wife but as we have seen in a previous chapter both the queen and mazarin were determined that the infanta should be queen of france and that his foolish romance with the mancini girl should be nipped in the bud there was also another powerful influence at work to thwart his passion for marie the indifference of the comtesse de soissons had given place to a fury of resentment and she needed no instigation of her uncle to determine at any cost to recover the place she had lost in louis's favour she brought all her armoury of coquetry and flatteries to bear on him and so far succeeded that we read the king has resumed his relations with the comtesse he has recommenced to talk and laugh with her and three days since he entertained monsieur and madame de soissons with a ball and a play and afterwards they partook of medianoche a midnight banquet together passing more than three hours in conversation with them meanwhile marie realizing the hopelessness of her passion in face of the opposition of her uncle and the queen and of louis's approaching marriage to the spanish princess had given him unequivocally to understand that their relations must cease and the rupture was complete when the countess of her sisters dallying with prince charles of lorraine of their assignations in the tuileries of their mutual infatuation and of the rumours of an arranged marriage cela est bien was always remarked but the dark flush of anger that flooded his face was a sweet reward to the countess for her treachery a few days later her revenge was complete when in the king's presence she rallied her sister on her low spirits you find the time pass slowly when you are away from paris she said nor am i surprised since you have left your love there to which marie answered with a haughty toss of the head that is possible madame one formidable rival thus removed from her path madame de soissons was not long left to enjoy her triumph 
for another was quick to take the place abandoned by the broken-hearted marie the beautiful and gentle la valliere who was the next to acquire an ascendancy over the king's susceptible heart once more the countess to her undisguised chagrin found herself relegated to the background to look impotently on while louis made love to her successor and to meditate new schemes of vengeance it was in vain that louis by way of amend found for her a lover in the marquis de varde the most handsome and dissolute of his courtiers for whom she soon developed a veritable passion her vanity might be appeased but her bitterness the spretoi injuria formoe remained and she lost no time in plotting further mischief with the help of monsieur de varde and the comte de guiche she sent an anonymous letter to the queen containing a full and intimate account of her husband's amour with la valliere the letter enclosed in an envelope addressed in the handwriting of the queen of spain fortunately for maria teresa's peace of mind the letter fell into the hands of louis himself who was naturally furious at such treachery and determined to make those responsible for it suffer when she should discover them as however the investigation of the matter was entrusted to de varde it is needless to say that the culprits escaped detection madame de soissons next attempt to bring about a rupture between the king and the lavalliere by bringing forward a rival in the person of the seductive mademoiselle de la motte audancourt proved equally futile when louis discovered by accident that she was but a tool in madame's designing hands and for a time the countess was sent in disgrace from the court to nurse her jealousy and to devise more effectual plans of vengeance what form these took seems clear from an investigation held at the close of sixteen seventy eight into a supposed plot to poison the king and the dauphin a plot of which la voisin one of the greatest criminals in history was suspected of being the ringleader during this inquiry la voisin confessed that the comtesse de soissons had come to her house one day and demanded the means of getting rid of mademoiselle de la valliere and further that the comtesse had avowed her intention to destroy not only louise's mistress but the king himself such a confession was well calculated to rouse a storm of indignation in france where madame de soissons had made many powerful enemies the chambre unanimously demanded her arrest but before it could be effected madame stoutly declared her innocence had shaken the dust of paris off her feet and was on her way to brussels during her flight to safety we are told the principal inns in the towns and villages through which she passed refused to receive her and more than once she was compelled to sleep on straw and suffer the insults of the populace which reviled her as sorceress and poisoner we are assured madame de sévigné writes that the gates of namur antwerp and other towns have been closed against the countess the people crying out we want no poisoner here even at brussels whenever she ventured into the streets she was assailed by a storm of insults and on one occasion when she entered the church a number of people rushed out collected all the black cats they could find tied their tails together and brought them howling and spitting into the porch crying out that they were devils who were following the countess in the face of such chilling hospitality madame de soissons was not tempted to make a long stay in brussels and after a few months of restless wandering in flandre and germany she drifted to spain where she succeeded in ingratiating herself with the queen she found little welcome however from the king who as the french ambassador to madrid wrote was warned against her he accused her of sorcery and i learned that some day ago he conceived the idea that had it not been for a spell she had cast over him he would have had children the life of the comtesse de soissons consists in receiving at her house all persons who desire to come there from four o'clock in the evening up to two or three hours after midnight there is sire everything that can convey an air of familiarity and contempt for the house of a woman of quality that carlos suspicions were not without reason was proved when one day his queen after it is said 
drinking a glass of milk handed to her by the countess was taken suddenly ill and expired after three days of terrible suffering that she died of poison like her mother the ill-fated sister of our second charles seems probable but that the poison was administered by the countess whose friend and protectress she was and who had every reason to wish her well is less to be believed in spite of saint simon's unequivocal accusation certainly the crime was not proved against her for we find her still in spain in the following spring when carlos his patience exhausted ordered her to leave the country after a short stay in portugal and germany madame de soissons was back in brussels where she spent the brief remainder of her days all the french of distinction who visited the city to quote saint simon being strictly forbidden to visit her here on the ninth of october sixteen ninety her beauty but a memory bankrupt in reputation friendless and poor the curtain fell on the life so full of misused gifts and baffled ambitions End of chapter. chapter twenty eight of love affairs of the courts of europe this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Casey E. Kennard. Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall. Chapter 28. An Ill-Fated Marriage. Few kings have come to their thrones under such brilliant auspices as Milan I of Servia. Few have abandoned their crowns to the greater relief of their subjects, or have been followed to their exile by so much hatred. But a fortnight before Milan's ascension, his cousin and predecessor, Prince Michael, had been foully done to death by hired assassins as he was walking in the park of Topscheider with three ladies of his court and the murdered man had been placed in a carriage, sitting upright as in life, and had been driven back to his palace through the respectful greetings of his subjects, who little knew that they were saluting a corpse. There was good reason for this mockery of death, for Prince Alexander Karagargevich had long set ambitious eyes on the crown of Servia, and resolved to wrest it by fair means or foul from the boy heir to the throne and it was of the highest importance that Michael's death, which he had so brutally planned, should be concealed from him until the succession had been secured to his young rival, Milan. And thus it was that before Karagargevich could bring his plotting to the head of achievement, Milan was hailed with acclamation as Servia's new prince, and on the 23rd June, 1868, made his triumphal entry into Belgrade to the jubilant ringing of bells and the thunderous cheers of the people. Twelve days later Belgrade was on fate for his crowning, her streets ablaze with bunting and floral decorations, as the handsome boy made his way through the tumults of cheers and avenues of fluttering handkerchiefs to the Metropolitan Church. The men, we are told, took off their cloaks and placed them under his feet that he might walk on them. They clustered round him, kissing his garments, and blessing him as their very own. They worshipped his handsome face, and loved his boyish smile. And when his young voice rang clearly out in the words, I promise you that I shall, to my dying day, preserve faithfully the honour and integrity of Servia, and shall be ready to shed the last drop of my blood to defend its rights. There was scarcely one of the enthusiastic thousands that heard him who would not have been willing to lay down his life for the idolized prince. It was by strange paths that the fourteen-year-old Milan had thus come to his principality. The son of Hefren Obrenovich, uncle of the reigning Michael, he was cradled one August day in 1854, his mother being Marie Cartargo of the powerful race of Romanian hospodars a woman of strong passions and dissolute life. When her temper and infidelities had driven her husband to the drinking that put a premature end to his days, Marie transferred her affection, without the sanction of a wedding ring, to Prince Cusa, a man of as evil repute as herself. 
in such a home and with such guardians her only child milan the future ruler of servia spent the early years of his life ill-fed neglected and supremely wretched thus it was that when prince michael summoned the boy to belgrade in order to make the acquaintance of his successor he was horrified to see an uncouth lad as devoid of manners and of education as any in the slums of his capital the heir to the throne could neither read nor write the only language he spoke was debased romanian picked up from the servants who had been his only associates while of the land over which he was to rule one day he knew absolutely nothing the only hope for him was his extreme youth he was at the time only twelve years old and michael lost no time in having him trained for the high station he was destined to fill the progress the boy made was amazing within two years he was unrecognizable as the half-savage who had so shocked the court of belgrade he could speak the servian tongue with fluency and grace he had acquired elegance of manners and speech and a winning courtesy of manner which to his last day was his most marked characteristic he had mastered many accomplishments and he excelled in most manly exercises from riding to swimming and to all this remarkable promise the finishing touches were put by a visit to paris under the tutorship of a courtly and learned professor thus when within two years of his emancipation he came to his crown the uncouth lad from romania had blossomed into a prince as goodly to look on as any europe could show a handsome boy of courtly graces and accomplishments able to converse in several languages and singularly equipped in all ways to win the homage of the simple people over whom he had been so early called to rule as mrs gerard says they idolized their boy prince every day they stood in long closely packed lines watching to see him come out of the castle to ride or drive as he passed along smiling affectionately on his people blessings were showered on him there was however another side to this picture of devotion there were those who hated the boy because he had thwarted their plans and this hatred as persistent as it was malignant was to follow him throughout his reign and through his years of unhappy exile to his grave but these days were happily still remote after four years of minority and regency when he was able to take the reins of government into his own hands his empire over the hearts of his subjects was more firmly based than ever his youth his modesty and his compelling charm of manner made friends for him wherever his wanderings took him from paris to constantinople he was the prince charming of europe as popular abroad as he was idolized at home and when the time arrived to find a consort for him he might one would have thought have been able to pick and choose among the fairest princesses of the continent but handsome and gallant and popular as he was the overtures of his ministers were coldly received by one royal house after another milan might be a reigning prince and a charming one to boot but it was not forgotten that the first of his line had been a common herdsman and the blood of Habsburgs and Hohenzollerns could not be allowed to mingle with so base a strain. Even a mere Hungarian count, whose fair daughter had caught Milan's fancy, frowned on the suit of the swineherd's successor. But fate had already chosen a bride for the young prince, who was more than equal in birth to any count's daughter, who would bring beauty and riches as her portion and who, after many unhappy years, was to crown her dower with tragedy. It was at Nice where Prince Milan was spending the winter months of 1875 that he first set eyes on the woman whose life was to be so tragically linked with his own. Among the visitors there was the family of a Russian colonel, Nathaniel Ketchko, a man of high lineage and great wealth. He claimed, in fact, descent from the royal race of Komnenos, which had given many a king to the thrones of Europe, and whose sons for long centuries had won fame as generals, statesmen, and ambassadors. And to this exalted strain was allied enormous wealth, of which the colonel's share was represented by a regal revenue of four hundred thousand roubles a year. 
But proud as he was of his birth and his riches, Colonel Nathaniel was still prouder of his two lovely daughters, each of whom had inherited in liberal measure the beauty of their mother, a daughter of the princely house of Sturza, and of the two the more beautiful, by common consent, was Natalie, whose charms won this spontaneous tribute from Tsar Nicholas when first he saw her. I would I were a beggar that I might every day ask your alms and have the happiness of kissing your hand. She had, says one who knew her in her radiant youth, an irresistible charm that permeated her whole being with such a harmony of grace, sweetness, and overpowering attraction that one felt drawn to her with magnetic force, and to adore her seemed the most natural and indeed the only position. Such was the high tribute paid to Servia's future queen at the first dawning of that beauty which was to make her also queen of all the fair women of Europe, and which at its zenith was thus described by one who saw her at Wiesbaden ten years or so later. She walked along the promenade with a light, graceful movement. Her feet hardly seemed to touch the ground. Her figure was elegant. Her finely cut face was lit up by those wonderful eyes, once seen, never forgotten. Brilliant, tender, loving. Her luxuriant hair of raven black was loosely coiled round the well-set head, or fell in curls on the beautifully arched neck. For each one she had a pleasant smile, a gracious bow, or a few words, spoken in a musical voice. No wonder the Germans, who looked at this apparition of grace and beauty, simply fell down and adored her. Such was the vision of beauty of which Prince Milan caught his first glimpse on the promenade at Nice in the winter of 1875, and which haunted him day and night, until chance brought their paths together again, and he won her consent to share his throne. That such a high destiny awaited her, Natalie had already been told by a gypsy whom she met one day in the woods of her father's estate near Moscow, a meeting of which the following story is told. At sight of the beautiful young girl, the gypsy stooped in homage and kissed the hem of her dress. "'Why do you do that?' asked Natalie, half in alarm and half in pleasure. "'Because,' the woman answered, "'I salute you as the chosen bride of a great prince. Over your head I see a crown floating in the air. It descends lower and lower until it rests on your head. A dazzling brilliance adorns the crown. It is a royal diadem.' "'What else?' asked Natalie eagerly, her face flushed with excitement and delight. "'Oh, do tell me more, please.' "'What more shall I say?' continued the gypsy, "'except that you will be a queen and the mother of a king, but then—' "'But then what?' exclaimed the eager and impatient girl. "'Do go on, please. What then?' And she held out a gold coin temptingly. "'I see a large house.' You will be there, but take care. You will be turned out by force. And now give me the coin and let me go. More I must not tell you. Such were the dazzling and mysterious words spoken by the gypsy woman in the Russian forest, a year or more before Natalie first saw the prince who was destined to make them true. But it was not at Nice that opportunity came to Milan. It was an accidental meeting in Paris some months later that made his path clear. During a visit to the French capital he met a young Servian officer, a distant kinsman, one Alexander Konstantinovich, who confided to him, over their wine and cigarettes, the story of his infatuation for the daughter of a Russian colonel, who at the time was staying with her aunt, the Princess Marusi. He raved of her beauty and her charm, and concluded by asking the prince to accompany him that he might make the acquaintance of the lieutenant's bride-to-be. Arrived at their destination, the prince and his companion were graciously received by the princess Marusi, but Milan had no eyes for the dignified lady who gave him such a flattering reception. They were drawn as by a magnet to the girl by her side, a child with a woman's grace and an angel's soul smiling in her eyes, the incarnation of his dreams, the very girl whose beauty, though he had caught but one passing glimpse of it, 
had so intoxicated his brain a few months earlier at Nice. "'Allow me,' said the lieutenant, "'to introduce to your highness Natalie Ketchko, my affianced wife.' Milan's face flushed with surprise and anger at the words. What was this trick that had been played on him? Had Konstantinovich then brought him here only to humiliate him? But before he could recover from his indignation and astonishment, the princess said chillingly, Pardon me, Monsieur Konstantinovich, you are not speaking the truth. My niece, Colonel Ketchko's daughter, is not your affianced wife. You are too premature. Thus rebuffed, the lieutenant was not encouraged to prolong his stay, and Milan was left reassured to bask in the smiles of the princess and her lovely niece, and to pursue his wooing under the most favorable auspices. This first visit was quickly followed by others, and before a week had passed the prince had won the prize on which his heart was set, and with it a dower of five million rubles. Now followed halcyon days for the young lovers, long hours of sweet communion, of anticipation of the happy years that stretched in such a golden vista before them. It was a love idol, such as delighted the romantic heart of Paris, and congratulations and presents poured on the young couple. The very beggars in the streets, we are told, blessing them as they drove by. Happy is the wooing that is not long a doing, and Milan's wooing was as brief as it was blissful. He was all impatience to possess fully the prize he had won. Preparations for the nuptials were hastened, but before the crowning day dawned, once more the voice of warning spoke. A few days before the wedding, as Milan was leaving the Marusi palace, he was accosted by a woman who craved permission to speak to him, a favor which was smilingly accorded. I know you, said the woman, thus permitted to speak, although you do not know me. You are the Prince of Servia. I am a servant in the house of the Princess Marusi. Your Highness, listen. I love Natalie. I have known and loved her since she was a child, and I beg of you not to marry her. Such a union is doomed to unhappiness. You love to rule, to command. So does Natalie and it is she who will be the ruler. You are utterly unsuited for each other, and nothing but great unhappiness can possibly come from your union. To this warning Milan turned a smiling face and a deaf ear, as Natalie had done to the voice of the gypsy. A fig for such gloomy prophecy. They were ideally happy in the present, and the future should be equally bright, however ravens might croak. Thus, one October day in 1875, Vienna held high holiday for the nuptials of the handsome prince and his beautiful bride, and it was through avenues densely packed with cheering onlookers that Natalie made her triumphal progress to the altar in her flower-garlanded dress of white satin, a tiara of diamonds flashing from the blackness of her hair, no brighter than the brilliance of her eyes, her face irradiated with happiness. That no royalty graced their wedding was a matter of no moment to Milan and Natalie, whose happiness was thus crowned. And when at the subsequent banquet Milan said, I wish from my very heart that every one of my subjects, as well as everybody I know, could be always as happy as I am this moment. None who heard him could doubt the sincerity of his words, or see any but a golden future for so ideal a union of hearts. By Servia her young princess was received with open arms of welcome. Her reception, we are told, was beyond description. The festivities lasted three days, and during that time the love of the people for their prince and their admiration of the beauty and charm of his bride were beyond words to describe. Never did royal wedded life open more full of bright promise and never did consort make more immediate conquest of the affections of her husband's subjects. No one could have believed that this marriage, which was contracted from love and love alone, would have ended in so tragic a manner, or that hate could so quickly have taken the place of love. 
but the serpent was quick to show his head in Natalie's new paradise. Before she had been many weeks a wife, stories came to her ears of her husband's many infidelities. Now the story was of one lady of her court, now of another, until the horrified princess knew not whom to trust or to respect. Strange tales, too, came to her, mostly anonymously, of Milan's amours in Paris, in Vienna, and half a dozen of his other haunts of pleasure, until her love, poisoned at its very springing, turned to suspicion and distrust of the man to whom she had given her heart. Other disillusions were quick to follow. She discovered that her husband was a hopeless gambler and spendthrift, spending long hours daily at the card tables, watching with pale face and trembling lips his pile of gold dwindle, as it usually did, to its last coin, and often losing at a single sitting a month's revenue from the civil list. Her own dowry of five million roubles, she knew, was safe from his clutches. Her father had taken care to make that secure, but Milan's private fortune, large as it had been, had already been squandered in this and other forms of dissipation, and even the expenses of his wedding, she learned, had been met by a loan raised at ruinous interest. Such discoveries as these were well calculated to shatter the dreams of the most infatuated of brides, and less was sufficient to rouse Natalie's proud spirit to rebellion. When affectionate pleadings proved useless, reproaches took their place. Heated words were exchanged, and the records tell of many violent scenes before Natalie had been six months Princess of Servia. You love to rule, the warning voice had told Milan, to command, so does Natalie. And already the clashing of strong wills and imperious tempers, which must end in the yielding of one or the other, had begun to be heard. If more fuel had been needed to feed the flames of dissension, it was quickly supplied by two unfortunate incidents. The first was Milan's open dallying with Fräulein S., one of Natalie's maids of honor, a girl almost as beautiful as herself, but with the beauté du diable. The second was the appearance in Belgrade of Dmitri Veseljevichka, who was suspected of plotting to assassinate the Tsar. Russia demanded that the fugitive should be given up to justice, and enlisted Natalie's cooperation with this object. Milan, however, was resolute not to surrender the plotter, and turned a deaf ear to all the princess's pleadings and cajoleries. The most exciting scene followed. Natalie, abandoning entreaties, threatened and even commanded her husband to obey her. And when threats and commands equally failed, she gave way to a paroxysm of rage in which she heaped the most unbridled scorn and contempt on her husband. Thus jealousy, a thwarted will, and Milan's low pleasures combined to widen the breach between the royal couple, so recently plighted to each other in the sacred name of love, and to prepare the way for the troubled and tragic years to come. End of chapter 28 Recording by Casey E. Kennard Chapter 29 of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Casey E. Kennard Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall Chapter 29 An Ill-Fated Marriage Continued If anything could have restored happiness to Milan of Servia and his princess Natalie, it should surely have been the birth of the baby prince, Alexander, whom both equally adored and equally spoiled. But instead of linking his parents in a new bond of affection, Sasha was from his cradle the innocent cause of widening the breach that severed them. For a time, fortunately, Milan had little opportunity of continuing the feud of recrimination with his high-spirited and hot-tempered spouse. More serious matters claimed him. 
Servia was plunged into war with Turkey, and his days were spent in camp and on the battlefield, until the intervention of Russia put an end to the long and hopeless struggle, and Milan found himself one February day in 1882, thanks to the Berlin Conference, hailed the first king of his country, under the title of Milan I. Then followed a disastrous war with Bulgaria, into which the headstrong king rushed in spite of Natalie's warning. Draw back, Milan, and have no share in what will prove a bloody drama. You have no chance of conquering, for Alexander is made of the stuff of the Hohenzollerns. And indeed the struggle was doomed to failure from the first, for Milan was no man to lead an army to victory. Read his method of conducting a campaign, as described by one of his aides-de-camp. Our troops continue to retreat. I never imagined a campaign could be so jolly. We do nothing but dance and sing and fiddle. Yesterday the king had some guests and the champagne literally flowed. We had the Belgrade singers, who used to delight us in the theater café. They sang and danced delightfully. The last two days we have had plenty of fun, and yesterday a lot of jolly girls came to enliven us. Such was Milan's method of conducting a great war, on which the very existence of his kingdom hung. Wine and women and song were more to his taste than forced marches, strategy, and hard-fought battles. But once again foreign intervention came to his rescue, and his armies were saved from annihilation. When his sword was finally sheathed, if not with honor, he returned to Belgrade to resume his gambling, his dallyings with fair women, and his daily quarrels with his queen, whose bitterness absence had done nothing to assuage. So far from Natalie's spirit being crushed, it was higher and prouder than ever. She would die before she would yield, but she was in no mood to die this autocratic, fiery-tempered, strong-willed daughter of Russia. She gave literally a striking proof of the spirit that was in her at the Easter reception of 1886, when the wife of a Greek diplomat, a beautiful woman, to whom her husband had been more than kind, presented herself smilingly to receive the salute courteous from Her Majesty. With a look of scorn, Natalie coolly surveyed her rival from head to foot, and then, in the presence of the court, gave her a resounding slap on the cheek. But the Grecian lady was only one of many fair women who basked successively, or together, in Milan's favor. A much more formidable rival was Artemisia Christich, a woman as designing as she was lovely, who was quick to envelop the weak king in the toils of her witchery. Not content with his smiles and favors, she aspired to take Natalie's place as Queen of Servia, and, it is said, had extorted from him a promise that he would make her his queen as soon as his existing marriage tie could be dissolved. And to this infamous compact Artemisia's husband, a man as crafty and unscrupulous as herself consented, in return for his promotion to certain high and profitable offices in the state. In vain did the emperor and the crown prince of Austria, with many another high-placed friend, plead with Milan not to commit such a folly. He was driven to distraction between such powerful appeals and the allurement of the siren who had him so effectually under her spell, until, in his despair, he entertained serious thoughts of suicide as escape from his dilemma. Meanwhile, we are told, a perfect hell raged in the castle. Each day brought its scandalous scene between his outraged queen and himself. His unpopularity with his subjects became so acute that he was hissed whenever he made his appearance in the streets of his capital, and Artemisia was obliged to have police protection to shield her from the vengeance of the mob. As for Natalie, this crowning injury decided her to bear her purgatory no longer. She would force her husband to abdicate and secure her own appointment as regent for her son 
or, failing that, she would leave her husband and seek an asylum out of Servia, and with the object of still further embittering his subjects against the king, she made the full story of her injuries public, and enlisted the sympathy not only of Milan's most powerful ministers, but of the entire country. The castle is in utter confusion, wrote an officer of the Belgrade garrison in October 1886. The king looks ill, and as if he never slept, poor fellow. He flies for refuge to us in the guard-house, and plays cards with the officers. Card-playing is his worst enemy. He loves it passionately, and plays excitedly and for high points, and he always loses. Matters were now hastening to a crisis. Hopelessly in debt, scorned by his subjects and hated by his wife, Milan's plight was pitiful. The scenes between the king and the queen were becoming more violent and disgraceful every day. There was no peace anywhere, nor did anyone belonging to the court enjoy a moment of tranquility. So intolerable had life become that early in 1887 Milan decided to dissolve his marriage, and it was only at the pleading of the Austrian emperor that he consented to abandon this design on condition that his wife left Servia. And thus it was that one day in April Queen Natalie left Belgrade, accompanied by her son Sasha, ostensibly that he might continue his education in Germany. But although husband and wife were thus at last separated, Milan's resolve to divorce her remained firm. "'I have to inform you,' he wrote shortly after her departure, "'that I have this day sent in my application to our holy national church for permission to dissolve our marriage, and that nothing might be lacking to Natalie's suffering and humiliation. He sent General Protisch to Wiesbaden with the peremptory demand that his son Sasha should return to Servia.' In vain did Natalie protest against both indignities. Milan might divorce her, but at least he should not rob her of her son, the only solace left to her in life. And when General Protisch, seeing that milder measures were futile, gave orders for the prince to be removed by force, the distracted mother flung one protecting arm round her boy, and pointing a loaded pistol with the other, threatened to shoot dead the man who dared approach her. Opposition, however, was futile. The following evening the boy prince was in his father's arms, and the weeping mother was left disconsolate. Thus robbed of her darling Sasha, it was not long before the second blow fell. The divorce proceedings were rushed through the synod. A deaf ear was turned to Natalie's petition to be allowed at least to defend herself in person, and on the 12th October, 1883, the marriage between King Milan I and Natalie, born Ketchko, was formally dissolved. Well might this most unhappy of queens write, The position is embittered by my conscience assuring me that I have neglected no duty, and that there is not a single action of my life which could be cited against me as a grave offence, or could put me to shame were it brought before the whole world. My fate draws tears from the very stones, but I do not ask for pity, I demand justice. If anything could have increased Milan's unpopularity, it was this brutal treatment of his queen. The very men who at his coronation had taken off their cloaks that he might walk on them, and the women who had kissed his garments now hissed him in the streets of his capital. In his own court he had no friend except the infamous Christisch. The general hatred even took the form of repeated attempts on his life. If he would save it, he realized he must abandon his crown. And one March morning in 1889, after informing his ministers of his intention to abdicate, he woke his twelve-year-old son with the greeting, "'Good morning, Your Majesty.' Milan was no longer King of Servia. His son, Alexander, reigned in his stead. Probably no king ever laid down his crown more willingly. He had put aside forever his royal trappings, with all their unhappy memories and their present discomforts and danger. 
but in distant Paris he knew a life of new pleasure awaited him, remote from the wranglings of courts and the assassin's knife. And within a week of greeting his successor as king, he was gaily riding in the bois, attending the theatres, supping hilariously with ladies of the ballet, or dining with his friends at Varese, where his somewhat rough manner and coarse jokes, the legacy of his swineherd ancestry, caused him sometimes to be mistaken for a parvenu, until a waiter would correct the impression by a whispered, "'That gentleman with the dark moustache is Milan, ex-king of Servia.' While her husband was thus drinking the cup of Paris pleasure, his wife was still doomed to exile from her kingdom and her son, with permission only to pay two brief visits each year. But Natalie, who had so long defied a king, was not the woman to be daunted by mere regents. She would return to Belgrade, and at least make her home where she could catch an occasional glimpse of her boy. And to Belgrade she went, to make her entry over flower-strewn streets, and through a tornado of cheers, and shouts of Zivella Rufa. It was a truly royal welcome to the great warm heart of the Servian people, but no official of the court was there to greet her coming, and as she drove past the castle which held all she counted dear in life, not even the flutter of a handkerchief marked the passing of Servia's former queen. Had she but played her cards now with the least discretion, she might have been allowed to remain in Belgrade in peace, but Natalie seems fated to have been the harbinger of storm. For a time, it is true, she was content to lie perdue, entertaining her friends at her house in Prince Michael Street, driving through the streets of her capital behind her pair of white ponies, or walking with her pet goat for companion, greeted everywhere and with respect and affection but her restless, vengeful spirit, still burning from the indignity she had suffered, would not allow her to remain long in the background. She threw herself into political agitation, and thus brought herself into open conflict with the regents. She inaugurated a campaign of abuse against her husband, whom she still pursued with a relentless hatred, and generally made herself so objectionable to the authorities that the scoop Shatina was at last compelled to order her banishment. When the deputies presented themselves before her with the decree of expulsion, she laughed in their very faces, declaring that she would only submit to force. I refuse to go, she said defiantly, unless I am expelled by the hands of the police. A few hours later she was forcibly removed from her weeping and protesting ladies, hurried into a carriage and driven off, with a strong escort of soldiers, on her journey to exile. But the good people of Belgrade, who had got wind of the proposed abduction, were by no means disposed to look on while their beloved queen was thus brutally taken from them. When the cortege reached the cathedral square, it was stopped by a formidable and menacing mob. The escort, furiously assailed with sticks and showers of stones, was beaten off. The horses were taken from the carriage, and the queen was drawn back in triumph by scores of willing hands to her residence. Natalie's victory, however, was short-lived. At midnight, when her stalwart champions were sleeping in their beds, the police, crawling over the roofs of the houses in Prince Michael Street, and descending into the queen's courtyard, found it a very simple matter to complete their dastardly work. The queen was again bundled unceremoniously into a carriage, and before Belgrade was well awake, she was far on her way to her new exile in Hungary. A few days later, a formal decree of banishment was pronounced against her, forbidding her, under any pretext whatever, to enter Servia again without the regent's permission. Only once more did Natalie and Milan set eyes on each other, when the ex-king presented himself at Biarritz to bring her news of their son's projected coup d'etat, by which he designed to depose the regents and to take the reins of government into his own hands. Taken by surprise, the queen received Milan, but when she saw him standing before her, 
an aged, broken man. Her composure gave way. She could not speak. She trembled like a leaf. With Alexander's dramatic ascension to his full kingship, a new, if brief, era of happiness opened to Natalie. The regents were no longer able to exclude her from Servia, and by her son's invitation she returned to Belgrade to resume her old position of queen. Still beautiful, in spite of all her suffering, she played for a time the role of queen mother to perfection, holding her courts, presiding at balls and soirees, taking a prominent part in affairs of state, and gradually acquiring more power than her easy-going son himself enjoyed. At last, after long years of unrest and unhappiness, she seemed assured of peaceful years, secure in the affection of her son and her people, and far removed from the husband who had brought so much misery into her life. But Natalie was fated never to be happy long, and once more her evil destiny was to snatch the cup from her lips, assuming this time the form of Draga Mashin, one of her own ladies-in-waiting, under the spell of whose black eyes and voluptuous charms her son quickly fell, after that first dramatic incident at Biarritz, when she plunged into the sea to his rescue and saved him from drowning. Many months earlier a clairvoyant at Paris had told Natalie, "'Your Majesty is cherishing in your bosom a poisonous snake, which one day will give you a mortal wound.' She had smiled incredulously at the warning, but she was soon to learn what truth it held. Certainly Draga Mashin was the last person she would have suspected of being a source of danger, a woman many years older than her son, the penniless widow of a drunken engineer, a woman, moreover, of whose life before Natalie had taken pity on her poverty many strange stories were told. How, for instance, she had often been seen in low resorts, with the arm of a forester or a tradesman round her, singing the old Servian songs. But she had not taken into account Draga's sensuous beauty, before which her son was powerless. Each meeting left him more and more involved in her toils, until, to the consternation of Servia and the horror of his mother, he announced his intention of making her his queen. Even Milan, degraded as he was, was horror-struck when the news came to him in Paris. "'And this,' he exclaimed, "'is the act of Sasha, my own son. He is a monster, a thing of evil in the eyes of all men. The Mashin will be the queen of Servia. What a reproach! What an evil! A creature like her! A sordid creature! Could he have not put aside his love for this low-born woman? But I could never make the fool understand that a king has duties. He has something else to think of but love-making. When taking leave of the friend who had brought him this evil news, Milan said, I shall never see Servia again. My experience has been a bitter one. Everywhere treachery and deceit. And now my own son. That has broken my heart. A few months later, worn out by his excesses, prematurely old and broken-hearted, the man who had prostituted life's best gifts drew his last breath at Vienna at the age of forty-six. As for Natalie, this crowning calamity of her son's disgrace did more than all her past sufferings to crush her proud spirit. But fate had not yet dealt the last and most cruel blow of all, that fell on that fatal June day of 1902, when her beloved Sasha's mutilated body was flung by his assassins out of his palace window, to be greeted with shouts of derisive laughter and cries of long live King Peter from the dense crowds who had come to gloat over this last scene in the tragedy of the House of the Aubrenvois. End of chapter 29 Recording by Casey E. Kennard End of Love Affairs of the Courts of Europe by Thornton Hall